Hello and welcome to the History on Fire YouTube channel. The video you're checking out now is actually audio only. It comes from a History on Fire podcast episode, so it's exactly like the podcast. However, this is not the only kind of thing that I'll be publishing here on YouTube. I'll also have videos that, are, uh, that combine my narration of a historical event with images. So please explore all the offerings on this channel, subscribe to it, and hit like to the videos you enjoy. And thank you so much for your support. Whether you like history or not, if you care about bravery, wisdom, passion, larger-than-life characters, and some of the most emotionally intense moments in human experience, you've come to the right place. Daniele Bolelli is a university history professor, writer, and martial artist, and he shall be your guide in a journey to the place where history and epic collide. This is the fourth and last episode in a multi-part series dedicated to the life of Lakota leader Crazy Horse in specific and the conflict between the US and the tribes on the Great Plains in general. It's probably a good idea to check out the previous episodes before you get started on this one so that the events narrated here will make more sense. This episode is dedicated to the memory of my friend James Weddell from the Yankton Sioux tribe. His Dakota name was Ishtatopa Igakopi. I learned much from him about loyalty, generosity, and bravery. So this is my way of saying thank you. Speaking of thank you, I want to quickly thank the sponsors who bring you this podcast. Today I'm sponsored by Geek Nation Tours, Datsusara, and Donnit.com. I actually really like what these companies bring to the table. I'm going to talk more about it at the end of the episode and also at the end of the episode I want to mention um, a few things regarding where I'm going after this you know now that we'll finish the crazy or series what are the future plans for the podcast but I figure I want to change things up a little and not spend too much time at the beginning with too much sponsor stuff and everything else before getting into the episode so I'll save all of this for the end so for now without further ado Let's go set history on fire. Most writings about American Indians tend to be hopelessly flawed. They either offer some highly romanticized image of native peoples as perfect beings who can do no wrong, or instead, under the guise of dispelling these stereotypes, you can see works that seek to reintroduce the older, negative, more racist stereotypes about native people. Uh, basically, these latter works tend to be thinly disguised racism passing a scholarship. Both of them, despite their different ideological orientations, both of them distort history to fit their agenda. Natives are people like anyone else, with all the vices and virtues that characterize people across the globe. By now it should be plenty clear that I clearly don't belong to the latter camp, the let's pretend to dispel stereotypes but really just to push a racist agenda camp. But today it should also be clear that I don't belong to the former highly romanticized camp either. In fact, some of the most despicable characters in tonight's story are Lakota people. Yes, a representative of the US government don't exactly come out very well either, but some Lakota in this story come across just as bad, if not worse. Some words from Friedrich Nietzsche perfectly fit for this last phase of the Crazy Horse story. Here is a quick selection from Friedrich Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Flee into your solitude. 
you have lived too closely to the small and the pitiable man. Flee from their hidden vengeance. Towards you, they have nothing but vengeance. Even when you are gentle towards them, they still feel themselves despised by you, and they repay your kindness with secret unkindness. In your presence they feel small, and their baseness glimmers and glows against you with hidden vengeance. Yes, my friend, you are your neighbor's bad conscience. They are unworthy of you. Thus, they hate you and would like to suck your blood. Nietzsche might as well have been talking about crazy horse, for every single one of these words here fits. Even though today Crazy Horse is universally loved by Lakota people, back in 1877, the downfall of the greatest Lakota warrior of his generation didn't take place in battle, since none of his enemies were able to bring him down in a face-to-face conflict. His downfall was the result of the jealousy and pettiness of small men, men who couldn't tolerate that Crazy Horse's mere presence was a constant reminder of how small they were. They dwarf next to him, and so they did what small men often do in these cases. Rather than doing the work necessary to become great men, rather than doing something amazing with their own lives, they focus their energy on bringing crazy horse down through guile and subterfuges. But in any case, enough with the prologue, let's pick up the narration of the events where we left off in the last episode. Following the battle at the Little Bighorn, the greatest camp in the history of Plains Indians had to break up. Never again would so many free Lakota and Cheyenne gather together again. As spectacular as a victory as the Little Bighorn battle was for the Lakota and Cheyenne, it really did nothing to change the situation that the tribes were facing. The bison were still disappearing, and the army was still chasing them. So they had to be constantly on the move, and with less time to dedicating to finding ever-dwindling supplies of food. So that's not exactly a very good equation. You know, the army is getting more effective at tracking you down. You have less time to chase less buffalo. Uh, Math seems very much to be on the wrong side for the Lakota and Cheyenne. In July 1876, as the news of Custer's defeat spread around the nation, the timing of this was a little tricky because it happened, you know, if you, if you think about it, July 1876, that means that the United States is celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. So the country was being swept in these big celebrations, everyone patting themselves on the back for what a big, strong country the United States has become. And so news that the U.S. Army was crushed by nomadic bands of buffalo hunters was not exactly... It struck the public mood in a bad way. So many, many people just started crying out loudly for revenge. Giving in to this pressure, Congress had to open up its pores. Congress had strife following the Civil War due to the monstrous deficit that the United States was facing, Congress tried to kind of nickel and dime the army to give only as little as humanly possible. You know, they wanted to conquer the Indian tribes, but they didn't want to pay for it. So in this context, Congress has to forget their stingy intentions and instead open up the purse and essentially let the military do what they want. General Sheridan at this time is able to manipulate the public mood to receive authorization for the military to take charge of the Lakota reservations. And on top of it, he's been given a lot more money to fund the army and um, allow for more troops to chase these dwindling numbers of Lakota and Cheyenne. On September 6, 1876, a commission arrived at the Lakota agencies requesting that the Lakotas who lived at the reservations signed away the Black Hills and they gave away their hunting rights. In other words, a lot of the things that the free Lakota have been fighting against, the Lakotas on reservation now are essentially being forced to give away. 
Um, the army basically tell them they will be removed to the Missouri River or to Oklahoma, and they better comply unless they want even worse things to happen to them. The blackmail here is, if you guys don't sign, you won't get any more food, and since by this time the Lakota Sun reservations were fully dependent on US government assistance, since they had to give up their whole lifestyle of chasing buffaloes when they surrendered into the agency, this policy became known as a sell or starve. You know, they either agree with everything that the army is asking them to do, or they can just sit back and starve. In the meantime, Crazy Horse, who was one of the leaders of those who had not surrendered at the reservations and was still running free, he headed out toward the Black Hills and made camp a little bit north of the Black Hills, and from here he would just go off on his own, just completely by himself, not leading raids with other warriors, just on his own he would do these raids into the Black Hills, where he would just sleep up high into the Black Hills peaks, with no fire at night, not to give away his position, and then either at dawn or dusk he would just come down and attack some of the miners in their camps, killing a few and running away. And an interesting detail that some of his descendants tell is that regularly after killing some isolated miners, Crazy Horse would uh, dig through their pockets, find whatever gold they had on them, and then rebury it inside the Black Hills. Now, clearly, there's something futile about all of this in the sense that what killing uh, one miner one day to another day, you know, as the Black Hills are being invaded by thousands of miners, what difference does that make? Really not much. It probably just makes Crazy Horse feel better, makes Crazy Horse feel that he's still fighting, that he hasn't given up, even though clearly none of these things change the outcome of anything that's going on. And actually things for the Lakota are about to get a little bit more grim. If you recall from the previous episode, General Crook had that unpleasant encounter with the Lakota and Cheyenne at the Battle of the Rosebud, shortly, just a few days before the Battle of the Little Bighorn took place. And after that, he had spent the rest of the summer away from the main campaign, because he really didn't feel like running into Lakota and Cheyenne anymore after that. Well, by now, Crook has found his courage again, and so he set his troops to... Uh, were searching for the hostile camps, trying to find wherever some of the free Lakota and Cheyenne still are. Problem is, it's still harder than advertised, so very quickly as they are running up and down the west, his troops start running out of food, to the point that some of his soldiers have to shoot and kill their own mules to eat them, because they have no food left. His troops' morale is clearly breaking, some of stories abound about some of these soldiers just falling down to the ground and crying, just unwilling to go one step further. So in this less than pleasant situation, Crook decided to send uh, one of his captains, Captain Mills, with 150 soldiers ahead to uh, reach the Black Hills, go into Deadwood, which was one of the main mining towns in the area, and buy food on credit, so that... To, in order to be able to feed the rest of his army. So on September 9, Mills, on his way to the Black Hills, ran into a camp of 37 Lakota lodges at a place known as Slim Buttes. And there's a bit of a debate going on among his soldiers regarding what to do. Most of his officers just want to stay away. They want to avoid this group of Lakota just go to the Black Hills, get the food, and be done with it. But Mills instead decide to attack this camp. So at dawn, his troops surround the village and attack. The surprise attack is fairly successful, and many Lakota have to very quickly flee the village. Quite a few of them will get on their horses and escape toward Crazy Horse Camp, which was located only a few miles away. Some of them, however, were not able to escape, so they retreated to a ravine just a little bit away from the main camp. Among them was the Lakota chief American horse, the Elder, 
along with many members of his family. There's a bit of confusion about the name American Horse, because this particular American Horse, the one that we refer to as the Elder, was a friend of Crazy Horse. Whereas later in this episode, we'll speak quite a bit about a different American Horse, what some historians will refer to as American Horse the Younger, will play a prominent role in our story as an enemy of Crazy Horse. So, just want to clarify that. This American horse, along with his men, they barricaded themselves within this ravine and engaged in some long-distance sniping with the army. And when offered to surrender, they refused. They had sent a request for help to Crazy Horse, uh, with some of the people from their own village who had fled. They told them, go warn Crazy Horse, tell him that we are in trouble here, come back here and help us. So they were hoping to hold on until Crazy Horse will be back with his warriors and be able to protect them. Problem is, is that General Crook, with the rest of his men, arrived at Slim Butte before Crazy Horse. So rather than having to deal with Captain Mills and his 150 soldiers, by now, when Crazy Horse will arrive, he'll have to deal with General Crook and his entire force of 2,200 men, which clearly changes the odds quite a bit. Once they got into possession of the camp, Crook and his men promptly destroyed most of the supplies that this uh, tribe had accumulated and captured their horses. While looking inside various tipis there, they found uniforms, mail, flags from the Caster's battlefield, indicating that this particular group of Lakota had been involved in the Caster battle. They also discovered in the village a little Lakota girl, probably three or four years old, who was screaming in fear for her mom. Captain Mills walked up to her and gave her some food and pet her, and she started kind of following him around, because probably she was scared as hell, and this was the first person who had showed her some kind of kindness in a fairly horrific situation. Later, as this girl is still following Captain Mills and is inspecting the corpses of the dead, the girl just let out a giant scream and ran to hug one of the dead bodies. In the words of Captain Mills, the sight was enough to touch the heart of the strongest man. Because essentially what had happened is the little girl had recognized her own mother among the dead. And, I mean, even, like, think about the way a guy like Captain Mills must have felt in that moment. Here you are trying to be nice to this three- or four-year-old that doesn't know anything about war or whose side was anybody's on, who's just dealing with the fact that you have walked into her camp and you just killed her mom. So Mills has a crisis of conscience moment. He, he decides to adopt the little girl. Actually, in, to quote Mills' own words, he said, I would adopt this little girl as I had slain her mother. That's a hell of a powerful sentence right there. Now, this intent, however, will not last all that long because no sooner does he think this that he realized that his own wife would never accept the social condemnation that went with bringing an Indian into their home. In other words, Captain Mills felt bad about killing the little girl's mom, but not bad enough as to deal with his neighbor's negative gossip. In the meantime, General Crook is getting annoyed with the fact that American Horse and his guys are not surrendering, so he ordered his men to surround the ravine and fire at will. The scene gets really chaotic and wild. You know, there's the noise of thousands of bullets being shot, children crying, Lakota warriors singing their death songs. And despite the tremendous noise, the screams of the women and kids who are loud enough the crook all of a sudden felt pretty bad about shooting women and kids, so he changed his mind and he ordered his soldiers to stop. Through his interpreters, crook offered to let the women and kids come out unarmed, and quite a few of them take him up on it. But American horse, a few of his warriors and some women refused to go even then. So now that some of the women and kids have 
come out and surrendered, uh, they will pick up where they left off and they will start the fighting again. In the words of a war correspondent for the Chicago Times, then our troops reopened with a very rain of hell upon the infatuated braves, who nevertheless fought it out with Spartan courage against such desperate odds for nearly two hours. Such matchless bravery electrified even our enraged soldiers into a spirit of chivalry, and General Crook, recognizing the fact that the unfortunate savages had fought like fiends in defense of wives and children, ordered another suspension of hostilities and called upon the dusky heroes to surrender. Never mind the prose from the 1800s, which is rather funny, you know, some of the imagery that this guy uses in describing the scene is somewhat flowery, but you still get the, you get the vibe of what's going on. And another war correspondent was uh, embedded with crook troops. Uh, this guy was working for the New York Times, also described the scene in the following way. The yelling of Indians, discharge of guns, cursing of soldiers, crying of children, barking of dogs, the dead crowded in the bottom of the gory, slimy ditch, and the shrieks of the wounded, presented the most agonizing scene that clings in my memory of Sioux warfare. After more negotiations, American horse agreed to surrender on the condition that the lives of his warriors would be spared. So he came out holding his bowels in his hands. He had been badly shot and was obviously about to die. Several of his people had also been killed in the ravine. And when American Horse came out, everyone freaked out because he walked around shaking hands with the soldiers with one hand while holding his guts in with the other hand as if nothing had happened. No sounds, no grunting, no complaints. Some of the soldiers wanted to shoot him right there and there. And uh, him, along with the other Lakota, had surrender. But Crook did not allow it. In the meantime, Crazy Horse and his warriors arrive onto the scene. They had imagined they would be facing only the 150 soldiers who participated in the initial attack. But instead, now they realize they have to deal with Crook's entire command of over 2,000 people. Oh, Crazy Horse and these guys are heavily outnumbered, but Crazy Horse will still send these estimates vary, but probably about 500 warriors forward anyway to shoot into Crook's camp from the rocks. The battle that follows is rather uneventful since neither side is able to do anything amazing. They kind of snipe at each other back and forth, but really comes to an uneventful conclusion. American Horse, in the meantime, is examined by a surgeon, and when the surgeon asks American Horse to pull the hands away from the wound so that he can examine it, his intestines start to spill out. Despite this, when he was offered morphine, American Horse refuses, preferring instead to bite on a stick, as that's the Lakota 1800 way of uh, version of a painkiller. A few hours later, he died. Uh, despite this, the surgeon said that he was cheerful to his last moment, spending most of his time just hanging out with his family, smiling, comforting them, and, you know, he seemed, as gruesome deaths go, he seemed like one of those guys who was able to rise above his circumstances in a way that seems almost inhuman. By the next day, uh, the Lakota under Crazy Horse were able to free most of the captives that had been captured by the army, and in the meantime, Crook retreats with his troops toward the Black Hills. Now, the Battle of Slim Buttes was really not that big of a victory. As one of the reporters with Crook troops said, the general impression in this command is that we have not much to boast in the way of killing Indians. In other words, it was not exactly the most life-altering battles in the history of military engagement, but it was still good enough to boost the morale uh, among the Crook troops as well as in the Black Hills. This was, after all, the first... Lakota defeat after the Little Bighorn. Now, in the Black Hills was fairly rare, 
when some of the settlers there managed to kill an Indian. And according to Lieutenant Burke, I quote, when the whites succeeded in killing an Indian, which happened at extremely rare intervals, Deadwood would go crazy with delight. The skull and scalp were paraded and sold at public auction to the highest bidder. In this case, it's more than one guy, they have defeated a whole village, so it's something to make the miners cheer. In the days to come, quite a few Lakota and Cheyenne from Red Cloud Agency came to Crazy Horse Camp, acting as visitors, but really they were spies working for Crook. They were there to report regarding village movements and not so subtly start selling the idea that surrendering and turning into the agencies was a good idea. There were actually quite a few Oglala, who is one of the subdivisions of the Lakota, Arapa and Cheyenne, who served as scouts for Crook. I mean, these are their own people, essentially. This is Lakota and Cheyenne working as scouts to go against other Lakota and Cheyenne. Now, in some way, some people may see these, these guys as sellouts. And sure, I can see the logic to that. At the same time, they believed that they were patriots, since they felt that if we help finish the war sooner, we'll spare more suffering uh, to our people. And, you know, maybe we'll, uh, if the war keeps going long enough and it gets more and more bitter, we may even lose more reservation land. So we think that the best option is to do the government's bidding and work with them. So that was their logic. Clearly, that's a very different logic from the, the one employed by the Lakota and Cheyenne who decided to keep fighting it out. But you can see, I mean... What I'm trying to do with this is just show you what each side was thinking, and then you draw the conclusions regarding which one you think had uh, more merit. A couple of months after the battle at Slim Buttes, another battle took place, in, in this case in November 1876, where another group of soldiers under Crook attacked a Cheyenne village in Wyoming. Over here, there was uh, over 173 lodges, uh, which meant roughly about a little over a thousand people living there, probably about 300 or so were warriors, and numbers that's not too little, but they were still clearly outnumbered by the soldiers. This was really the remnants of most of the free Northern Cheyenne, the ones who hadn't surrendered. They were, most of them were all located into this one camp. Now, a medicine man for the Cheyenne had a dream that they were about to be attacked. But a leader of the Kit Fox Warrior Society named Last Bull insisted that, no, let's not move camp yet. I'm glad you had this dream. Yeah, maybe I even believe you. But give us another day or two because I want to celebrate this great raid that we had against the Shoshone. So let's part it out for a day or two, so they spend the night kind of dancing, celebrating their victory over the Shoshone. But by dawn the next day, the soldiers attack. In the words of a Cheyenne who was in the camp, I quote, Grey light was seeping into the canyon when the charge came. The thunder of hoofs and the war chants of enemy scouts awoke the village. Rifles and pistols took up their song of death. Under the file, the Cheyenne weren't lacking in regard to a poetic touch in their description of the whole thing. But I'm sure it didn't feel all that poetic for the guys being shot at in the camp. Now, in that moment, the soldiers took control of the village, while the Cheyenne had to flee in a hurry. You know, again, there wasn't really much of a battle because the Cheyenne recognized that they were about to get crushed by the army, so they mainly had to flee from camp. One of the main Cheyenne leaders, by the name of Dull Knife, was ready to surrender. He had seen a couple of his children being killed during the battle and wasn't willing to risk the lives of more of them. However, other Cheyenne insisted to try to uh, keep fighting. 
In the meantime, while they were sniping at each other from a long distance, the soldiers who had taken control of the camp started burning all the supplies that the Cheyenne had accumulated for the winter. Some 700 of their horses were divided up among the scouts serving for the army. And from this point forward, the Cheyenne had to quickly flee the battleground, basically with nothing on. Most of them didn't even have a blanket on them in the middle of a freezing winter in Wyoming. So for 11 days, they marched in the snow with each night bunch of the babies were dying of cold. Eleven of them froze to death on the way to the next friendly camp that they could run into. In a scene that seems to be taken straight out of the Revenant, or rather, the Revenant may have taken it from this, on a regular basis, when horses were too weak to go on, they would be killed, their stomach would be cut open, and babies were placed inside in order to keep them warm and alive during these freezing nights. After 11 days of travel, the Cheyenne reach Crazy Horse's camp. But Crazy Horse himself wasn't doing all that great. In the words of Short Bull, one of the men who lived at Crazy Horse's camp, we helped the Cheyenne the best we could, but we didn't have much ourselves. In the meantime, a different general in charge of a separate group of soldiers, because there are quite a few who are hunting down the Lakota and Cheyenne at this time, General Miles tried to reach out and negotiate with Crazy Horse. So the Lakota sent a few men to meet with Miles, but before they even reached the soldiers' camp, some of Miles' crow scouts came out, they shook hands with the Lakota, But as they were doing that, one of the crow recognized that one of the Lakota was riding on his wife's horse. His wife means the crow man's wife's horse. She had been killed not long before this time. And so the crow scout doesn't take it too well, because he basically recognized that the odds are is that this man is his wife's killer, and promptly killed the Lakota rider. The other crows fall on the remainder of these few Lakota who have been sent to negotiate with General Miles and kill them all. Miles was mad as hell, because he felt like, I don't care who killed whom, you know, this was important in trying to negotiate a peace with Crazy Horse. And, you know, he tries to send gifts toward Crazy Horse camp saying, you know, the crows made a mistake, it wasn't, in, you know, I wasn't behind it. But several leaders, including Crazy Horse, decide to just break away, uh, not talk to General Miles, and just keep away from the soldiers. General Miles dismissed all of his crow scouts, but this was too little too late, as the hope for negotiations had failed in this instance. In the meantime, though, the remaining free Lakota and Cheyenne had very little time to hunt, since the soldiers were hot on their trail the whole time. Up until this point, Crazy Horse had always respected the free will of his people, letting individuals choose whether they wanted to turn themselves into the reservations or stay with him. But by now he's getting desperate, and so he starts cracking down on dissent. When some reservation Lakota arrive, offering surrender and just offering to lead back to the reservation anybody who wants to. Crazy Horse and his friends get up and tell everybody that if anyone try to leave, they will be killed. Now, a few of these people decide not to listen to Crazy Horse, and there are 13 lodges uh, full of people decide to flee. But Crazy Horse and these guys just catch up with them, shoot their horses, take their weapons, and force them to return with them. Quite a few of Crazy Horse's own people are getting a little turned off by these heavy-handed tactics, but in some way the very fact that Crazy Horse was going there is an indication of his desperation, of the fact that things really weren't going well. To boost morale in the meantime, Crazy Horse launches a raid 
that will lead to stealing over 150 horses from General Miles' troops. And this is to try to induce General Miles to chase them into an ambush. The chase goes on for almost 100 miles, and eventually by January 8, 1877, a battle takes place, but a few Cheyenne warriors spoil the ambush by showing themselves too soon. The battle will rage on for a while, become known as, as a very cool name, it's called the Battle of Wolf Mountains, sound awesome, but it's rather inconclusive from a military standpoint. Neither side was able to score a real victory. Uh, but, yeah, inconclusive all you want, the fact remained that General Miles returned from this battle to a well-stocked camp, while Crazy Horse returned to dwindling supplies and low morale. A few days later, on January 15th, the other major Lakota leader who had been the primary symbol of Lakota resistance, Sitting Bull, arrived to visit Crazy Horse. He and these guys show up at Crazy Horse's camp, but there's simply not enough food to keep the camp going together. Um, they will meet, but they will shortly afterwards have to split because there are not enough resources for that many people in that space. During their meeting, Sitting Bull made clear that he felt there was no hope left in the United States. He felt that the best option was to try to escape crossing the border into Canada and try to keep living the old life, keep chasing some of the remaining buffalo herds in Canada under a different government where maybe things could be better. Crazy Horse wasn't feeling Canada. He wanted to stay on the hunting grounds. Not that he was overly optimistic about his chances, but he didn't really want to leave his homeland. In one of the rare quotes attributed to Crazy Horse by primary sources, Crazy Horse is supposed to have said to Sitting Bull, My friend, the soldiers are everywhere. The Indians are getting scattered, so that the soldiers can capture or kill them all. This is the end. All the time these soldiers will keep hunting us down. Someday I shall be killed. Well, all right. I'm going south to get mine. To which Sitting Bull replied, I do not wish to die yet. You know, their split was very friendly. You know, they had, over the last seven years together, they had built basically the entire Lakota Cheyenne resistance to the American expansion had been built by Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. They had done something amazing when you think about the relative small number of Lakota and Cheyenne facing the entire United States. But it was clear that the game was up by now. So it's a very friendly but also very melancholic split that takes place here. Uh, this would be their last meeting. They were never going to see each other again. Now, a few people don't share Crazy Horse's desire to just keep going till the end, so a few, a few more keep defecting this, despite Crazy Horse's opposition and killing of their horses. Uh, this scene repeats itself two or three times, and is an indication that things are really not going so well for the Lakota. But even Crazy Horse resistance is beginning to wear off. Uh, the millionth time that some Lakota show up from a Red Cloud agency offering peace, Crazy Horse gives a speech saying, look, I'll do whatever the rest of my tribe wants to do, okay? I'm, I'm not going to make the call no more. I'm not going to force people to do what they don't want to do. If they want to surrender, I surrender. If they want to stay, I'll stay. While this is going on, the rivalry between different generals is kind of funny. You have General Crook fearful that General Miles would be able to claim victory by being the one who convinces Crazy Horse to surrender. Crook starts his own negotiation with Crazy Horse's camp and offers to make wild concessions off the record. He says, whatever Miles is telling you, essentially, I'll give you a better peace deal. You know, you don't want to be, if you surrender, you don't want to be removed to the Missouri River, no problem. You won't have to go. 
you can keep their horses, you can keep, uh, we'll give you a separate reservation if you want. You know, he's offering all these promises to make it more appealing to surrender to him rather than to surrender to General Miles. Among the people who were ready to surrender were Black Elk and his family. Black Elk, if you recall, we mentioned him in previous episodes of this series. He's also the lead character in the famous book Black Elk Speaks, that's all about his life and his visions and and so on and so forth. In any case, in Black Elk Speaks, Black Elk tells how he and his family is on their way to surrender, they run into Crazy Horse. They found Crazy Horse all alone on a creek. Well, actually, not exactly all alone. He was Crazy Horse and his wife uh, by this creek, away from the rest of the camp. I'll quote from Black Elk Speaks. After that, the people noticed that Crazy Horse was weirder than ever. Uh, By the way, I'm using the word weird because um, uh, in Black Elk Speaks they use the word queer, which, as I mentioned in previous episodes, in today's language it has a connotation that's more associated with homosexuality. That's not the meaning that Black Elk is using here. It's probably just meaning strange and weird, so that's what I'll use. So let's try this one again. After that, the people noticed that Crazy Horse was weirder than ever. He hardly ever stayed in the camp. People would find him out alone in the cold, and they would ask him to come home with them. He would not come, but sometimes he would tell the people what to do. People wondered if he ate anything at all. Once my father found him alone like that, and he said to my father, Uncle, you have noticed me the way I act, but do not worry. There are caves and holes for me to live in, and out here the spirits may help me. I am making plans for the good of my people. Black Al continues, He was always a weird man, but that winter he was stranger than ever. Maybe he had seen that he would soon be dead and was thinking how to help us when he would not be with us anymore. Who knows exactly what Crazy Horse was thinking, but it seems obvious that he was trying to vision quest, trying to figure out, is there any way out of this trap? You know, he realized that his options were disappearing by the minute, He did not really see any kind of possible positive outcome in anything, not in resistance, not in surrender, not in anything. And he was trying to figure out some other way. In the meantime, his wife had come down again with another bout of tuberculosis. So perhaps due to this reason as well, by now Crazy Horse was a little closer to being willing to surrender than he had ever been. So after Crook had promised him that he could have his own reservation, Crazy Horse led his people to surrender on May 1877. There were over 900 people with them, which was basically almost the entirety of all the remaining free Lakota. On May 6th, Crazy Horse's people paraded into Camp Robinson, which was one of the main army headquarters close to the... um, in the Red Cloud Agency. The column of all his people stretched over two miles long, and all of them were singing with one voice the same song as they walked in. Uh, The New York Times reported about this surrender and described it as how it looked like a victory celebration rather than a surrender, that it was quite an impressive sight to see these almost a thousand people walking in in their finest regalia, singing the same song. It was kind of a powerful moment. Now Crazy Horses got off his horse and to symbolize the end of his wartime leadership, he gave his war shirt to Chief Red Cloud, who was the main uh, leader on, at the agency. He uh, then went on to shake hands with Crook's subordinate, Lieutenant William Clark, At the same time as this was happening, the same week, Sitting Bull and these people were crossing over into Canada. 
So by now there really were no more free Lakota. With Crazy Horse Surrender was it. That was the the last moment when the army was still dealing with free Lakota. Clark and Crazy Horse sat on the ground and Crazy Horse declared, I want this peace to last forever. Among the people who saw Crazy Horse, because interestingly enough, you know, very few white people up until this moment had seen Crazy Horse, and the one who had seen him often had not been around to tell other people for very long after that, because usually was in the middle of bloody battles. So among the people who reported, uh, you know, there's more written about the, the next few weeks of Crazy Horse's life than there is uh, about the entirety of what happened up until this point. In this case, one lady by the name of Susan Tackett who was the daughter of a trader uh, who was married to a Lakota woman. She was there, she saw Crazy Horse coming in, and Susan's Lakota mother-in-law pointed Crazy Horse to her, and Susan wrote down her impression of what he looked like. In her words, he was a very handsome young man, of about 36 years or so. He was not so dark, he had hazel eyes, nice, long, light brown hair. His scalp lock was ornamented with beads and hung clear to his waist. His braids were wrapped in fur. He was partly wrapped in a broadcloth blanket. His leggings were also navy blue broadcloth. His moccasins were beaded. He was above medium height and was slender. That's about the main physical description that we have of Crazy Horse, one of the most completes we get. Now let's consider for a second the game that General Crook had been playing. Crook had promised that Crazy Horse could get his own reservation and that he would be allowed to leave the reservation to go on some big buffalo hunts. Crook basically promised a whole bunch of things in order to promote surrender and gain a diplomatic victory since he would be the one to whom Crazy Horse surrendered. He also said that he would bring a crazy horse to Washington. Uh, and the reason for this is simple. His plan was to leave it up to the president to say no to all the things that Crook had promised. You know, in this way, he could appear as if he wasn't really breaking the promises. He would be alongside with crazy horse, pretending to support him. But really what's going on is that he would play good cop and make the president play bad cop. This was a classic problem that the US government was dealing with. You know, the War Department often ignored the promises made by the officers in the field, which made it impossible for Indians to trust Americans. You know, you would be negotiating with some representative of the US government, you know, a general or some high standing military officer, and they would tell you if you surrender, these are the conditions you will get. So you surrender thinking that that's the final word, except that later some other branch of the government will say, oh, no, 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 that guy who made you those promises didn't have the authority, so sorry, but you're out of luck. Yes, you surrender, but no, we're not going to give you what that other guy told you. Specifically, Crook made two promises he couldn't keep. He promised that Crazy Horse could get his own reservation in the north, and he promised a 40-day buffalo hunt late in summer. But at this time, Crazy Horse still didn't know that these were lies. The early going of the surrender didn't look so bad. You know, a doctor came to visit Black Shoal, Crazy Horse's wife. Crazy Horse, in the meantime, tried to show that he meant what he said by asking one of the interpreters there on the reservation to teach him how to use fork and knife, you know, and to do stuff to basically show, look, I'm willing to assimilate to some degree. A strange moment took place where many of the free Lakota were being unused to the very rich food that was more typical on the reservation. After eating a whole bunch of it, got royally sick, crazy horse among them. You know, they were really not used to all the flour and sugar and all these other commodities. So after 
eating too many of them, they just were knocked out in their teepees for quite a while. At this point, quite a few of them were recruited as scouts. You know, the chain of command went from Clark, who as Crook's representative was the head military officer here, and um, then there would be a chief of scouts, who was a guy by the name of Captain Randall, and then three main Lakota leaders would be the Lakota leaders of the scouts, specifically Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and Crazy Horse. Spotted Tail had a reputation for being a bit bossy, so quite a few people, particularly from the Minneconju branch of the Lakota, they had originally surrendered at Spotted Tail Agency, which was right next to the Red Cloud Agency, but decided to switch and instead they claimed Crazy Horse as their head chief, which, needless to say, made Spotted Tail very jealous. In the meantime, some of the, the top brass in the army, generals such as Sheridan and Sherman, told the crook that he could forget about whatever he had promised Crazy Horse, that no Crazy Horse was not going to get his own separate reservation, and actually they wanted to have Crazy Horse and some of his key allies arrested and wanted the whole tribe to be removed to an agency on the Missouri River. This made the negotiations a bit complicated for Crook. He arrived at Red Cloud Agency in late May, and because he had no good news on any front, he promised to placate them, he promised the Lakota a buffalo hunt later in the summer. If nothing else, Crook was a little more... He tried to get along with some of the Lakota leaders, for example. He sat down with them and they had a big feast in which they ate what was considered a delicacy, which was dog. Whereas uh, Crook's subordinate, Clark, refused to do that, was kind of grossed out. Crook also said that the trip to Washington would have to wait, since the President of the United States was too busy at the moment. And so we begin to see that the promises that were made are beginning to break down here. And this will be one of the big factors creating tension on the reservation. In the words of the interpreter Billy Garnett, Crazy Horse had come to the agency with nothing but honorable intentions. So Crazy Horse probably meant it when he said he wanted peace from now on. But this was not going to happen. Annoyed with what was going on, Crazy Horse moved his village north of the White River, basically making a statement of independence from Red Cloud. Uh, among the people who emerged as some of his rivals, Little Big Man, who had been one of his allies early on in the wars against the United States, got into a big fight with Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse, in not so many words, had told him not to sleep with a married woman, that this would cause trouble. Little Big Man decided, screw you, you don't tell me what to do, had done it anyway, and this had created a rift between Little Big Man and Crazy Horse. So Little Big Man moved some of his people away, and ask for the food that the Lakota were being given by the government to be issued separately from Crazy Horse. And this is where some of the employees at the agency started playing game. They agreed with this, then they started giving him his food before Crazy Horse and these guys would get any, sort of trying to play up whatever rivalry they could see in perfect divide-and-conquer fashion. Among the agency leaders who were trying to help Crazy Horse integrate was a guy by the name of Young Man Afraid. Uh, he was, you know, yes, he had been among those who had surrendered to the United States long before this time, but he was honestly trying to create uh, good feelings between his own people and Crazy Horse's people. On the other hand, there were other leaders, such as Red Cloud and American Horse, who wanted nothing more than to marginalize Crazy Horse and these guys. Uh, they order their warriors to prevent their own people from visiting Crazy Horse's camp from mid-June forward. Because things weren't going quite bad enough between the agency Indians and Crazy Horse's people, Somebody had the bright idea to organize a fake battle to commemorate the Custer fight 
and symbolically in a not so subtle way they ask the agency indians to act as caster guys to pretend they were the seventh cavalry with the crazy horses people being the lakota and it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the potential for things to escalate here is quite high and promptly they do so the sham battle turns out not to be so sham anymore and turns out in almost the real things as both sides are beginning to whack each other with war clubs in fairly heavy fashion and at some point things are escalating people start pulling out guns to the point that clark had to gallop in the middle of them to stop an actual battle from taking place on june 26 crazy horses people decide to organize a sun dance the sun dance was one of the most important ceremonies that the lakota practiced Unlike most of the Lakota rituals, which can be done at any point of the year by one person, by multiple people, you know, they are usually characterized by a lot of flexibility. The sun dance is a one-time thing. You know, each community will organize it once a year in summer. And the ceremony itself is uh, quite powerful, rather interesting. I'm not going to spend too much time on it i probably will pick it up in later episodes when we'll deal with lakota culture again but just to give you an idea what happens is that uh, ahead of the ceremony a tree is cut and is carried back in the middle of the sundance ground where the ceremony will take place and for the next four days um, while the rest of the community will sit on the outside of the circle watching the ceremony the people directly participating into this ritual will fast, will dance, usually from the time the sun comes up to the time the sun goes down with a few breaks in between, and they will pierce. Typically the way they did piercing was uh, somebody would be you know, dancing along, doing their thing, then they would walk up to the tree, pray there, one of the people organizing the ceremony will come up to them, lift some skin off their chest, pierce it, put a wooden skewer through it, did the same thing on the other side of the chest. These wooden skewers would then be tied to a rope that's tied to the tree, and the person would keep dancing, attached to the tree in this fashion. Now at some point during those four days, whether a few minutes later or a whole four days later, the person will eventually start leaning back until they break loose. The other way of piercing is piercing from the back, and again it's tied to a rope, but in this case not tied to a tree, it's tied to buffalo skulls that will be dragged around the Sundance circle. In either case, pretty intense kind of stuff that, you know, if you have grown up with this ceremony, we are used to it, it's no big deal. Clearly for people who are not from that culture, it's striking, it's, it begs the obvious question, why would you do that to yourself? But interesting enough, I have to say, I don't have a great rational way to break it down, to explain it in a way that I find satisfactory. I mean, in some way, I, I guess I can feel better because I've heard a million different explanations for why the Sundance take place, why the piercing and everything else. But on another level, from witnessing quite a few Sundances and seeing the people doing the piercing and everything else, uh, on an emotional level, it, it made sense to me. I can't quite put it into words, but um, I definitely remember the feeling. In any case, you know, it doesn't without going too deep everybody understands the notion of sacrifice just about every religion in the world include one form or another of sacrifice in many religions in their history there was animal sacrifice some religions had human sacrifice some religions will just require you to abstain from certain food or certain activities on certain points of the year you know sacrifice can be something very mild or something very intense but usually the point tends to be that by giving up something that you value, you are inviting the powers that be to listen to your prayers um, by making it clear that you are serious about it and you are willing to initiate this exchange by you give up something you value in order to receive something back. The way the Lakota saw it, nothing is more real and your own than your own blood. So the shedding of the blood at the Sundance was one of these forms of sacrifice. In any case, 
The ceremony works its magic and apparently managed to bring a little bit of unity back between the agency Indians and Crazy Horses people. Uh, this is Sundance season, so each community is staging their own Sundance. So in June, still, Crazy Horse then goes on to visit uh, the other agency next to Red Cloud, Spotted Tails Agency, because two different Sundances were taking place there. And uh, both of these Sundances were organized by some of Crazy Horse's friends and relatives. So he goes there, attends these ones as well. In the meantime, Crazy Horse's absence from Red Cloud Agency dooms the popularity of a different Sundance that the agency Indian were organizing there, to the point that so few people show up that they decide to cancel it. Which is kind of embarrassing after the success of Crazy Horse's own Sundance. Speaking of religion and how the agency Lakota and uh, Crazy Horse people were becoming more and more divided, there's one interesting story involves a man by the name of Elkhead. Elkhead was the keeper of the pipe. Now, this warrants a little bit of background to help you understand how important this role was. In uh, Lakota religion, the story goes that at some point in a very distant past, when the Lakota people were starving and were looking for food everywhere, uh, one day some hunters walked into a woman on the prairies, who told them to go back to camp and prepare things for her arrival. The story continues that by the time she reached the Lakota camp, she was bringing a bundle. She unwrapped it and showed them a pipe. Lakota pipes are, they have a very long wooden stem and a bowl that's made of a particular stone. She showed them how to unite two parts of the pipe. She told them some of the ceremonies that go with the pipe. And after that, she left camp. And as people saw her leaving, they saw her shapeshift, turning into a buffalo, meaning she wasn't a real flesh and blood woman. She was a buffalo spirit who had taken the shape of a woman to bring this gift to the Lakota people. This origin story it underscores a couple of very important things. It underscores among them the importance of the pipe in Lakota religion. Just about all Lakota ceremonies involve the smoking of the pipe. And um, why am I telling you this whole story? Because this man by the name of Elkhead was the keeper of what the Lakota believed to be the original pipe that had been brought by this buffalo spirit way back in the day and from which all other pipes were modeled. So if you are thinking of, you know, in all religions there are sort of sacred relics, important artifacts, these would probably be the most important of the ritual objects in Lakota life. Symbolically, this particular pipe was it when it came to Lakota religion. So the man who was in charge of taking care of this pipe had a particularly key role in Lakota spirituality. And he was, uh, he threw in his lot with Crazy Horse. He became a big Crazy Horse supporter and joined this camp. So what it seems to be happening here is that everybody was beginning to pick sides. Now, Red Cloud and Spotted Tail, who had been the big man on the reservation up until this point, are not thrilled with what they see. They are rather jealous. Crazy Horse to them is a painful reminder of someone who made no compromises, someone who carries himself with an aura of honor, that clearly those who have negotiated away the Lakota way of life a little more every day do not possess. Crazy Horse represented the past, the past that all Lakota, no matter where they stood, all longed for, when they definitely had a better life. So, you know, Red Cloud and Spotted Tail, maybe they had their reasons for doing what they did. Maybe it's because they believe, uh, you know, negotiations with the U.S. government will lead to a better future for our people. We need to be realistic. Crazy Horse's stance is unrealistic. That's all possible, but the fact remains that they look like people who sat there with U.S. government authorities negotiating away Lakota rights 
whereas Crazy Horse came across as this incorruptible, more noble figure. As this tension is brewing between them, Krug keeps telling Crazy Horse to go to Washington. Crazy Horse is not exactly feeling it. He doesn't really want to go. Um, a man by the name of James Irwin had taken his post as the new civilian agent at Red Cloud in the meantime, and he narrates this situation of tension. Spotted Tail in particular is very jealous of Crazy Horse's growing following. Uh, the fact that Clark, another one of these army officials on the reservation, was, had raised Crazy Horse as a supreme position among the scouts, and there were rumors floating around that if Crazy Horse went to Washington, he would be made the number one chief of all Lakota. These obviously are baseless rumors, but nonetheless they were flying around and they indicate the fears that some of the agency chiefs were feeling. Um, Crazy Horse didn't really care about any of this, but what he wanted was to establish his own reservation before going to Washington. Um, the army, on the other hand, they suggested the opposite. Go to Washington first, then we worry about your reservation. In the words that are attributed to Crazy Horse in a conversation with his friend, He Dog, Crazy Horse is reported as having said, First, I want them to place my agency on Beaver Creek, west of the Black Hills. Then I will go to Washington. For your benefit, for my benefit, or for the benefit of all of us. And that is the only reason why I will go there. Despite Crazy Horse's intention to do something for the benefit of all Lakota people, the agency chiefs such as Red Cloud and Spotted Tail and a few others, their blood pressure is keep climbing as they see Crazy Horse receiving all this attention, you know, all the civilian visitors to the reservation, they would be introduced to the chiefs and they would be like, oh yeah, that's great, Red Cloud, okay, yeah, that's nice, but where's Crazy Horse, where's Crazy Horse, who wanna meet Crazy Horse, you know, Crazy Horse was the legend there. The other chiefs were, oh yeah, here is a chief, whatever, people didn't care, and these guys felt slanted. Their ego kicked in and they started really resenting Crazy Horse. In the words of a native by the name of Little Killer, when Crazy Horse first came to Forrest Robinson, he wanted to go to Washington. But other Indians were jealous of him and afraid that if he went to Washington, they would make him chief of all the Indians on the reservation. These Indians came to him and told him a lot of stories. And if you bear with me for a few minutes, we're gonna see what some of these stories were and how they dramatically impacted Crazy Horse and the army officials' reaction to Crazy Horse. Because things weren't quite complicated enough, let's add another layer of messiness to this whole story. A few cabins next to Camp Robinson, there was um, the cabin belonging to a man by the name of Joe Larrabee. He lived with the Cheyenne, he, was, uh, he had two wives and nine kids, and among them was an 18-year-old girl named Nellie, also known as Brown Eyes. I don't think it has anything to do with Van Morrison brown-eyed girl, but you never know. She was apparently quite beautiful, and lots of people were flirting with her. Uh, Clark was flirting with her, also there was an uh, agency Oglala by the name of Little Burr who had uh, asked Joe Larrabee to, uh, you know, he started entertaining negotiations to be able to marry Nellie, and Joe had preliminarily accepted some gifts from Little Burr indicating approval of a possible marriage. Now, on one day when Crazy Horse came into at Camp Robinson to pick up the food that was promised to his people, Nellie just stared at Crazy Horse. And he was really not used to this, because most Lakota women were taught to be somewhat bashful and not to be so openly flirtatious. So it was kind of unusual for him, and he found it rather interesting. So after this, Crazy Horse started visiting her at her home, and gave away some horses to her father. Now, most of Crazy Horse's friends were against the idea of Crazy Horse taking on a new wife. Clark, on the other hand, 
pushed him to marry, figured that it would be something to calm him down a little to make things easier. Now, there are different versions of this story, because some of Crazy Horse's descendants say that uh, Crazy Horse never married Nelly, that Nelly was actually a spy sent to him by Red Cloud, and that she just moved in with Crazy Horse later to become uh, kind of a nurse to Crazy Horse's wife, but that they were never married. Um, just about every other source instead indicate that they did marry, so... This is fairly typical, that when in history, more often than not, you run into multiple versions of the same events, and it's up to you to dig through it and figure out what you think actually happened. In the meantime, during another one of these interminable meetings that were taking place on the reservation, Erwin, along with Young Man Afraid, proposed to have a feast at Crazy Horse's village. This got Red Cloud bent out of shape over this, so he stormed out of the meeting. Red Cloud felt that several times over the summer he had been pushed aside while Crazy Horse had gained the spotlight. And he resented the fact that, you know, they were treated as equals, despite the fact that Red Cloud had been a quote-unquote friendly to the United States for a really long time, whereas Crazy Horse had been... Uh, of fighting the US, involved in war, defeating Custer, doing all these things, and now they treat him the same, you know, Red Cloud really resented this. Spot the tail in particular would really didn't want Crazy Horse to go to Washington since he was afraid that everybody would pay attention to Crazy Horse as the leader of the battle at the big, Little Big Horn, and this would cast a shadow on Spot the tail and nobody would pay attention to him. So he was all, you know, you, you really can see some petty egos at player. And this is where things move from the little jealousies and gossips that we've seen so far that, you know, I'm sure you guys by now get the picture. But the reason why I emphasized it so much is because it leads to some very practical consequences. By this point, Red Cloud send a few of his men to talk with Erwin to complain about Crazy Horse saying that first it's not right to have this feast at Crazy Horse's camp, and also subtly suggesting that Crazy Horse is still a hostile, and he's just waiting for a chance to break away. They say that if Crazy Horse and these guys are allowed to go on a buffalo hunt, he and his men will go on the warpath, and if you give them enough ammunition, they'll use this ammunition to kill white people. It's pretty obvious to see what Red Cloud is trying to do. He's trying to simultaneously make Crazy Horse feel insecure so as not to participate in the Washington trip and then use any time Crazy Horse is not going to give in to military demand as proof that he really is a hostile and is about to break out. Considering how long and how difficult it had been for the army to bring Crazy Horses in, they are obviously very sensitive about even the possibility that anything like this can happen. So when some other Lakota start voicing these ideas, they start taking it really seriously and they get scared. While this is happening, Nelly Larrabee went to visit Black Shawl, Crazy Horse's wife, and told her that essentially she wanted to be Crazy Horse's second wife. And Black Shawl was a good sport about it, and she said that a new wife would uh, may help Crazy Horse's mood. So by the time Crazy Horse came back into camp, he was surprised by the move, but apparently accepted it. Again, that's one version of the story. The other version is that Nelly just moved in as a nurse to take care of Black Shawl, and so there are these two possibilities. While this is going on, Clark sent a message inviting all Indians who want to join Crazy Horse for a hunt. And Spotted Tail repeats the same rumor that Red Cloud had started. He said, are you crazy? You know, Crazy Horse is going to start war again. Um, don't do this. Don't let him go on a hunt. And as this is happening, there's an interesting tale about Crazy Horse telling uh, agency interpreter by the name of Frank Groard about a dream he had. 
In this dream, Crazy Horse saw an eagle falling right next to him, which had been killed by an arrow. Clearly, you know, you don't need to be a master dream interpreter to figure out that this is probably not a good dream. At the same time as this climate of tension is building, Nelly contributed to the rumors by telling Crazy Horse that the Washington delegation was just a trick designed to have him arrested. So some people think Nelly was indeed a spy for Red Cloud, sent there just to increase Crazy Horse's paranoia and made him not listen to the army, which in turn could be used by Red Cloud to see, you see, I told you about this guy that is trouble. Other people instead defend Nelly's behavior, saying that she was just repeating all the stuff that she was hearing at Red Cloud Agency. Bottom line is everybody's whispering in Crazy Horse's ears. In the words of Major George Randall, he said that Crazy Horse was being, I quote, talked to too much, but if they would just leave him alone and not buzz him so much, he would come out all right. Gossips are becoming snares to try to trap Crazy Horse in this story. To give you an idea of how weird things were getting, there's a story of a Lakota from Red Cloud Agency who started courting a woman in a teepee next to Crazy Horse's lodge just so he would be able to go there often to be able to spy on Crazy Horse. So tension is building in the village, tension is building on the reservation. One of Crazy Horse's friends by the name of He Dog decided to start camping somewhere else. And He Dog told Crazy Horse, he basically asked, look, what's going to happen if I move away? You know, is you're going to take this as a betrayal? Is that going to be a problem? In his own words, he said, does this mean that you will be my enemy if I move across the creek? And Crazy Horse just laughed. He said, don't worry, I'm no white man. They are the only people who make rules for other people that say if you stay on one side of this line, it is peace, but if you go to the other side, I will kill you all. There's plenty of room, camp wherever you want. So they part on good terms. That's one of the very few interactions that Crazy Horse will have with anybody on good terms. As this is going on, Clark kept pressing Crazy Horse for this Washington trip. And Crazy Horse obviously makes a mistake here because he insists on wanting to nominate everyone who's going to come on the trip with him. And Clark flat out says, no, that's not going to happen. You know, you get to pick the people from your village to come with you, but people like Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and some of the other leaders are going to go whether you like it or not. So Crazy Horse is getting bent out of shape. Clark is getting annoyed with Crazy Horse demands. Things are turning sour between them. And as a result, Clark decides to officially cancel the buffalo hunt. These push Crazy Horse further into a bad mood, so things are clearly heading in a bad direction. As this happens, news arrive on the reservation that uh, the Nespers, the Nespers are a tribe out of originally at the border between Washington and Oregon. They had broken out from their own reservation for reasons that we won't get into, because that's a whole great story on its own. Who knows, maybe I'll cover it one day on the podcast. So the Nespers had broken out of the reservation and had been engaged in a series of running battles with the army over many, many miles. So as a result of this, the, um, the army asked some of the Lakota to send their warriors to help the army crush the Nespers. The Northern Lakota, Crazy Horse followers, were not happy with this. Crazy Horse seemed rather confused by all this. He says, you have asked us to become peaceful. How can you ask us now to go to war again? He seemed like, maybe I can go, but this doesn't make much sense. This is not what... Uh, so they have a meeting with Clark on August 31st. Touch the Clouds, who's uh, one of Crazy Horse's relatives and friends, gives a speech about first being told to, I quote, give up his gun, and he did it. Then he was to enlist as a scout to keep peace and order at the agency, and he did that. Then he was asked to throw away the buffalo hunt, and he did that. 
Then, like a horse with a bit in its mouth, his head was turned toward Washington, and he looked away. Now the great father, the Grey Fox, which was the Lakota name that they gave to General Crook, and White Hat, which was the Lakota name for Clark, put blood on their faces and turned them to war. In other words, he says, you guys have lied to me and Crazy Horse and some of the others, but if we have to, we'll obey and we'll go fight against the Nespers. It's kind of hard to tell what was being said or understood in this conversation. Crazy Horse apparently emphasized the idea that if, in exchange for scouting and going against the Nespers, he wanted to be able to go on the buffalo hunt that he had been promised. And Clark was willing to negotiate, but he said only the men can go. Your women and kids have to stay here at the agency. The entire village cannot go with you. Crazy Horse again started... He was getting annoyed with this negotiation. He said, if the white man could not conquer his enemies, I would conquer it for him. But if any of us are going to go north for a buffalo hunt, then we're all going to go. And more likely than not, what's happening is that the translators at this meeting, where they were all red cloud men, one in particular, Frank Grouard, mistranslated multiple times Probably he had been put up to this by some of the agency chiefs in order to put Crazy Horse in a bad light with the army. Um, during one of the many crazy translations that Gruard offers, he, he tells Clark that Touch the Clouds had declared that he would join the Nespers and fight against the soldiers, which is something that they never said at all. In one of Crazy Horse's um, speeches, he said, we are tired of war. We came in for peace, but now that the Great Father asks our help, we will go north and fight until there is not a Nespers left. Except that this statement is translated by Grouard as we will go north and fight until there is not a white man left. That's not exactly the same meaning here. That's a pretty big mistranslation, which is either a sign that you really should not be the translator because you don't understand a word of what's being said or is more likely than not a sign that you are being put up to this by Red Cloud since Red Cloud was uh, the head chiefs that Groard responded to and you know Groard had a history of betraying uh, Lakota that he had been friendly with he had done it with Sitting Bull and it looks like he's doing it with Crazy Horse now by the time Gruard left and was replaced with a different translation named Billy Garnett, the damage had been done already. Crazy Horse was mad and didn't want to go fight the Nespers anymore. So Clark telegraphed Bradley saying that Crazy Horse and Touch the Clouds were leaving on the warpath, which is something that nobody had said. You know, Crazy Horse had never declared it, Touch the Clouds had never declared it. They said that they were going on a hunt. So it's an interesting way how statement seems to be from I'm going to go and fight the Nespers because into I'm going to go and kill all white people. I'm going to go on a hunt becomes I'm going to go on the warpath. It seems here that certainly Red Cloud, but possibly Clark as well, may be on this together to try to twist Crazy Horse's words in a way to give them a rationale to crack down on him. Now, Crazy Horse is obviously making mistakes here in his negotiations, in the way he's speaking. You know, Crazy Horse has never been a politician. He was a man of action. He was a warrior. Except there was no action on the reservation. There was only an interminable series of meetings and uh, diplomacy and bureaucracy and all sort of crap that he had no interest in. That's what was required of him at this point. And he was not particularly skilled at it. So from the looks of it, it seems that he's getting ensnared in a web of political intrigues. It's in this context that Crook decides to visit Fort Robinson to sit down with Crazy Horse for a council to clear things up. So this is the opportunity for Crazy Horse to make things right. It seemed like Okay, there's been all this bad communication, bad translation, all of this stuff going on, but now it's going to be one-on-one, Crazy Horse and Crook being able to sit down and clarify things. So everything's going to be okay, right? 
Well, a man, a Lakota man by the name of Woman Dress, who was a relative of Red Cloud, went toward Crook before Crook had a chance to reach Crazy Horse's camp to quote unquote warn him that Crazy Horse was planning on stabbing Crook during the meeting and killing him. He was planning on killing Crook, killing Clark, killing all of their men, and then escape north. Now again, there's not one shred of evidence to suggest that any of this is true. However, Crook got scared and changed his mind, decided no longer have a meeting with Crazy Horse. So instead, he met with all the agency chiefs, the Red Cloud, American Horse, all of those guys, and he told them about what he had learned. He said, hey, I heard that Crazy Horse is planning to kill me, which is something that probably the agency chiefs have made up. So all the pieces of this trap that they have set up are all falling into place for them. So Crook asked that, he asks of them that as a show of loyalty, they help in arresting Crazy Horse. The plan was to send him to Fort Marion, um, along with Kiowa, Southern Cheyenne, and Comanche prisoners of war. And to show how what a tough and hard decision this was for the agency chiefs, they all basically jump up offering, forget arresting him, we offer to kill him for you. Just give us the word and we'll take care of it. So the plan is to surround Crazy Horse's village and go take care of business. One of the people who seem really intent on setting things up in order to kill Crazy Horse is American Horse. He convinced a very reluctant Little Bear. Remember that guy, Little Bear, the one who had been courting Nelly Larrabee? He convinces him to go back and demand that Nelly is handed back to him. So with a group of warriors sent by American Horse, a little bird goes along, the hope that they have is that Crazy Horse will resist, and so they will have a good excuse to kill him. Problem is, is Crazy Horse is not there when they get there, so they do take Nelly back, and they shoot down Crazy Horse's horse just to, to make a point. So it's pretty clear where this is heading. Crazy Horse and his brother-in-law, Red Feather, received news that Clark had offered lots of money as a reward to whoever killed Crazy Horse. So here we have Crazy Horse not really knowing what to do, just sitting in his teepee, alone, with his knife drawn, ready to die whenever the attack will come. Red Feather comes to tell Crazy Horse, hey, the soldiers are coming, we need to get out. Crazy Horse says nothing, he just sits in his teepee and holds out his knife. But eventually he snaps out of it and thinks of fleeing to spot a tail agency to bring his wife, Black Shoal, to the safety of her relatives. In the meantime, some of the warriors from his camps go out in order to face all of the Oglala coming from the agency to arrest him. Uh, the whole thing gets pretty tense, weapons are drawn, uh, one of the warriors on Crazy Horse's side, by the name of Black Fox, just sped out from the column, went toward the soldiers and uh, other Lakota and said, I have look all my life to die, I see only the clouds and the ground, I'm all scarred up. Now this big macho speech doesn't really last very long, because American horse walk up to him, they start talking, and clearly Black Fox must have not looked that hard to die since he quickly changes his mind and agrees to abandon Crazy Horse. So by now, Crazy Horse with his wife and a couple of his guys, they hop on their horses and flee for Spotted Tail Agency, just as the Indian police as the soldiers arrive to get him. A couple of Red Cloud relatives by the name of No Flesh and another one named No Water, are sent to chase him down, all of them proclaiming that they will kill Crazy Horse as soon as they have a chance. The reason why they go to Spotted Tail is because at Spotted Tail there was a man by the name of Horn Chips, who was one of Crazy Horse's best friends. Crazy Horse's father lived there, several of his wife's relatives lived there, so they figure 
Maybe we'll have some friends to help us out. In the meantime, Clark sent a message to Lee, who was the agent at Spotted Tail Agency, telling him that um, Crazy Horse had fled and that he should try to capture him, and he promises money to anybody who will be able to arrest him. During this mad dash toward the Spotted Tail Agency, Crazy Horse tell his wife and his couple of friends that they are going to hop on their horses and ride them anytime they go downhill, but every time they're going to go uphill, they're going to get off the horses and walk. Why in the world would you do that? Well, the whole idea was that that way the horses would be fresh anytime they get to ride them, but then they would give them a break on the way uphill. The Indian police chasing them doesn't follow the same policy. They just ride their horses as far as they can go, both uphill and downhill, and in the process the horses start tiring out and they're not able to keep up. Uh, no water in particular end up killing two of his horses by riding them too hard trying to catch up with Crazy Horse. By the time the Crazy Horse arrives at Spotted Tail uh, Agency, he's greeted with cheers by quite a few people there. But Spotted Tail and these guys are not quite as thrilled. They resent Crazy Horse as much as Red Cloud had. So they lead him to meet with the agents at the reservation by the name of Burke and Lee. And Crazy Horse tell them, I've been talked to night and day until my brain has turned. Now, Spotted Tail is an interesting character. You know, early in his life, he had earned a reputation as a tough warrior. But very, you know, already quite a few years prior to this point, he had clearly switched, abandoned the warpath and became he had become very friendly to the U.S. government. Black Elk, in his book Black Elk Speaks, does not have a whole lot of nice things to say about Spotted Tail. In his words, he says, I saw him, and I did not like him. He was fat with washichu food, and we were lean with famine. And which makes him wonder, how could men get fat by being bad and starve by being good? In this context, Spotted Tail approached Crazy Horse and said, We never have trouble here. You have come here and you must listen to me and my people. I am chief here. We keep the peace. We the Brule do this. Everybody here obeys me. And every Indian who comes here must listen to me. You say you want to come to this agency and live in peace. If you stay here, you must listen to me. That is all. It's an interesting speech to see how many times he said the word I, listen to me, obey me. The guy clearly had a few issues in terms of wanting to be recognized as the boss. Now, again, I keep... I want to be fair to people like Spotted Tail or Red Cloud or some of these people who don't seem to come across very well in this telling, but... You know, I do understand their position of thinking that negotiating with the U.S. government would be the best choice for their people. Maybe it was. It's, I'm not saying that there is anything uh, inherently wrong in what they are doing. You know, yes, they may be look wimpy today. You know, by today's standards in the highest of history may look like an um, overly compliant choice. But maybe that was the only realistic one. Maybe they were doing the right thing. I don't think they can be blamed for adopting this strategy. What they can be blamed, however, for, what's kind of disgusting about their behavior, is that it took them about 0.2 seconds to turn on one of their own when they didn't have to. You know, it seemed like the jealousy, the personal ego kicking in when it comes to the relationship with Crazy Horse has nothing to do with... Um, what policy they believe was best for their people. I mean, by now, Crazy Horse had embraced the same policy. He had surrendered. He was going to work for peace. He was basically going to be adopting the same course of action. This had nothing to do with that choice. This had everything to do with personal jealousy and ego. That's the part about these guys that's less than... Uh, um, that doesn't make them look particularly good. So under pressure from Spotted Tail, Crazy Horse continued his discussion with Lee and Burke, 
saying that he really couldn't understand why there were bad feelings against him at Red Cloud Agency, that his words had been twisted, and that he didn't believe that peace was possible at the Red Cloud Reservation. You know, they asked him about the speech that he had delivered to Clark, and Krasior said, I never said any of those things. I don't know where any of this stuff come from, because I did not say it. So, you know what, to avoid all this trouble, why don't you just transfer me Red Spotted Tail, and I'll leave in peace over here, just keep me away from Red Cloud Agency, that's just a bad place for me. However, a note arrived from Bradley requesting the arrest of Crazy Horse. So, Agent Jesse Lee has a bit of a problem now, because he likes Crazy Horse, and he does feel that he may be telling the truth. But nonetheless, he has to obey orders, so he tells him that he'll have to go back to Fort Robinson at Red Cloud Agency and to explain his situation there to General Bradley. Crazy Horse is seeing his options disappearing. He tells that night to his friends, Touch the Clouds, that after he will die, his bones will turn to rock and his joints to flint. He has this kind of somber visions of his decaying body. Um, Bradley had told Lee, I quote, Crazy Horse must be held as a prisoner and must come here as such. Burke and Lee tell him, that's not going to happen. You know, yes, we're going to send him back, but we can't arrest him because if we try to arrest him, it's going to be a huge fight and we don't want to have it. So Crazy Horse, the next morning, he doesn't want to go. He say, look, if I go to Red Cloud, there will be trouble. He's trying to avoid the situation. He's trying to say, look, this is not going to end well. Why do you keep forcing me in that direction? And... The agents say, no, you have to go back, you have to explain yourself there, come on, you know, just go and face the music at Red Cloud Agency. Crazy Horse realized that this is it, that there's really nothing he can do, so he smiles at them, and in Lakota he said, Oh, Anpe to Kile Mitawa, which is, this day is mine. Now, what this day is mine means becomes obvious in light of what will happen next. One of his friends handed him a gun that Crazy Horse hid under his blanket, and he gets ready to ride back to Red Cloud Agency. As this is going on, Clark sent a message to Crook saying that Crazy Horse had been arrested, and the reply he receives from Crook is that Orders from up top, from General Sheridan, are that he's uh, to eventually be sent to Chicago and from there to be imprisoned at Fort Marion in Florida. As Crazy Horse and these guys are riding back into the agency, his supporters and Red Cloud supporters begin insulting each other. Both sides are ready to go for their guns. Quite a few of Red Cloud guys are openly pulling out their guns, getting ready to shoot Crazy Horse. So Touch the Clouds uses his men to create a screen around Crazy Horse and instruct to remember which of the Oglala first lifts his gun because they are to die if they try to do anything to Crazy Horse. Now, this is an unbelievable part of the story that takes place now. The two leading figures at Red Cloud Agency among uh, the military there, Bradley and Clark, who have played such a big role in the story up until now, as Crazy Horse is coming back into camp, they decide to retire to their quarters. They are done working for the day and their work day is over. Which, let's think about it for a second. This is probably the biggest event of their entire tenure there. And they decide to hide away. Now, there are two possibilities here, because, you know, obviously they must recognize that the situation is very delicate and that something big can happen at this point. So either they are extreme cowards, or there's probably quite a bit of room for conspiracy theories here that they are just planning on setting up his murder and they don't want to be seen with their hands in it. So they just go back to their room, lock the door, and decide that they are not going to deal with it. 
So Bradley, in particular, refused to see Crazy Horse and hid away, leaving the job to arrest him to one of his subordinates. Crazy Horse's friend, He Dog, walked up to Crazy Horse, went to shake hands with him, and warned him, Look out, watch your step, you're going into a dangerous place. <laughs> Which, if stating the obvious were an Olympic event, He Dog would have easily won the gold, because... Come on, really? It's like, it's pretty clear what's going on here. Of course it's a dangerous place. Little Big Man, now a policeman on the reservation, enforcing US government orders, he grabbed Crazy Horse and started manhandling him, saying, come on, you coward, which was one of the funniest things you could say to the guy who had been the very symbol of Lakota bravery for the previous years. Crazy Horse look at him like he's insane. He's like, what are you even saying? Now, Lee, one of the agents from Spotted Tail, was a bit disgusted with what was going on at the Red Cloud Agency. He thought he was bringing Crazy Horse back so that he could meet with Clark and clarify things, and instead he realized that this is a setup. In a letter to a friend, Lee wrote, We have brought him over here, and done our duty to the government, and done all we could for him. But at the same time, as much as he tried to rationalize this whole thing, he will keep feel guilty for years because of his role in this. So, at this point, they turn him over to a captain by the name of Kennington. They turn him over to Captain Kennington to set him up for the night. They start pushing Crazy Horse toward the building, and... While Crazy Horse supporters and on one side and American horses and Red Clouds men on the other, yelling at each other, loading their guns, you know, it's a very dramatic scene right now. And they are clearly pushing Crazy Horse toward the local jail to arrest him. Uh, as Crazy Horse is about to walk in, he realizes this is a prison. It's clear that no one had told him that they were arresting him, and this is where he realized what's being planned for him. He sees on the walls... Um, shackles, he sees some prisoners there in leg irons. So he turns around and says, I'm not going there, and begins a struggle trying to get out. He pulls out a knife and takes another one from the hands of Little Big Man. Kennington pulls out a sword and tries to block Crazy Horse, so they start fighting sword against two knives. Little Big Man, in the meantime, tries to grab Crazy Horse, and it starts into a big hand-to-hand -hand combat scene. Um, Crazy Horse uses his knives to cut Little Big Man's hand and forearm again and again. Immediately, Red Cloud and American Horse tell their followers, shoot to kill, and Kennington starts screaming, kill him, kill him. Little Big Man and some of the others tackle Crazy Horse, but he managed to break free, just as in that moment, a soldier walks up behind him and stabs him in the back with a bayonet. And he'll stab him a second time, try to stab him a third time and misses. Little Big Man grabs again Crazy Horse, at which point Crazy Horse says, Let me go, my friend. You've hurt me enough already. There's a drawing by a Lakota artist by the name of Amos Bad Heart Bull which while actually we'll use it in the um, History on Fire website as the cover for this episode, which shows Crazy Horse's arms being held by his own people while a soldier is stabbing him in the back. An uncle of Crazy Horse pushed this gun into Little uh, Big Man's belly, saying, you have done this once before, referring to the time when Little Big Man had held Crazy Horse during the no-water shooting from a previous episode. Touch the clouds, grabbing Crazy Horse and asking his men to push the other Oglala away, all the ones who are trying to still shoot Crazy Horse to push them away. So there's a few of his guys, a he dog as well, blocks another warrior who was walking up trying to finish off Crazy Horse. It looks like a battle is about to start and it looks very likely, like Lakota will be killing Lakota at this point. The doctor stationed there examined Crazy Horse right there and immediately understood that Crazy Horse was dying. 
Kennington, however, still ordered that Crazy Horse is to be brought inside the jail. Crazy Horse's men will have none of that. They lift up their guns, they point it at the soldiers and say that if they try to put him in jail, they are going to get shot. A Frenchman who lived there by the name of Bat Poirier, who had married among the Lakota, walk up to Kennington's and tells him, for God's sake, Captain, stop! You know, he understands that a battle is about to break out and the only thing he can do to try to not make it happen is stop insisting on throwing Crazy Horse in jail. In all of this, Clark and Bradley refuse to walk out of the room. They are busy hiding away. Clark will give the authorization to take Crazy Horse to a different room, not in jail, but other than that, they still stay locked far away while all the drama takes place. They go back and forth because Clark agreed, but Bradley hasn't. He still wants multiple times to keep indicating that Crazy Horse is to go to jail. After enough negotiation, Bradley gives in and they agree to let that go. Curiously enough, by the way, as these negotiations are taking place, some of the very Lakota who had been clamoring to kill Crazy Horse, to have him arrested, all of that, now they are changing their mind. American Horse all of a sudden says, Crazy Horse is a chief and cannot be put in the guardhouse, meaning in jail. It's almost as if now that they realize that they have him killed, they are backpedaling rather quickly. So they carry Crazy Horse in this room. He refused to be placed on the bed and instead prefers to be laid on the dirt in the ground. The doctors start giving Crazy Horse morphine and uh, his father arrives. Upon hearing his father's voice, Crazy Horse wakes up since he was kind of passing out from loss of blood. He turns to his father and says, Father, it is no good for the people to depend on me any longer. I'm going to die. And... Later into the night, shortly before midnight, he did, indeed, finally die. His friend touched the clouds, put a blanket on him, and stated, He has looked for that, and it has come. Crazy Horse's father doesn't have too many doubts regarding who's responsible for his son's death. He says flat out that it's Red Cloud and Spotted Tail, that they have become jealous and that they had set up this web of intrigues to cause his eventual murder. In the words of Crazy Horse's father, he was killed by too much talk. Now, a lot of the hatred against Crazy Horse seemed to evaporate with his death. And shortly after this, Crazy Horse will become the most beloved icon among all Lakota. Which is weird when you consider that it was other Lakota who contributed heavily to his death. After the news of his death break out in the camp, many of the people there expect a big fight. Agent Lee instructed his wife on how to kill herself if they were attacked. And his wife and... Uh, a certain Angie Johnson was the wife of a captain stationed there, were both disgusted with the many broken promises made to Crazy Horse. Uh, they wrote these in letters to their family, how these had a lot to do with what just happened. Among the many people who are, don't know how to respond to what happened is a man by the name of Fastander, who had been a good friend of Crazy Horse, but... Now he had helped bring Crazy Horse in to Red Cloud Agency because he had been assured that he would be safe there and instead he realized that he had been used and had essentially just led Crazy Horse to his death. So shortly before dying, Crazy Horse had turned to him saying that you did this, you sided with white people. And after Crazy Horse died, Fastander is mad with guilt, with grief, he wants to go out and fight, but... He doesn't know what to do, and there's a story told by his grandson, a famous Lakota leader by the name of Matthew King, who says that even in his old age, many years after the fact, Fastander would sit on the banks of Wounded Knee Creek and talking to himself would keep saying, they fooled me, they fooled me, because apparently the events of this day never really left him. 
and it left a permanent scar in his psyche. Crazy Horse's father does not want his son to be buried at Red Cloud Agency. Needless to say, to him, this place, which what later will become the Pine Ridge Reservation, is a place of enemies, is not a place where he wants the final resting place of his son to be. So instead, his father, with a few relatives, they leave camp, taking um, Crazy Horse's body with them, and nobody really knows where they go, which is why the burial of Crazy Horse remain a mystery to this day where probably only a few family members know what happened. After this, his father and some of his relatives flee the Red Cloud Agency. They go into hiding since they think that they are all after them. Uh, most of them are going to go to reservations, the what will become Rosebud Reservation, Cheyenne River, Standing Rock, but definitely as far away from Red Cloud Agency, what will become as Pine Ridge as they possibly can. Uh, in a bitter irony, now that Crazy Horses is dead, the Red Cloud's people now demand an agency in the north, which was exactly what Crazy Horse had been asking all along. A few days later, they leave for a trip to Washington, the famous trip to Washington that had been promised, and the president there tells them to go to the Missouri for this winter, and then they can go where they want to the next spring. Now, that's not exactly what's going to happen, but in any case. A few people such as Fast Bull, Low Dog, flee the reservation, and some of them join Sitting Bull in Canada, some of them just flee for a while trying to figure out if they can uh, live as free Lakota again, which prompts Clark to comment, even as a dead chief, Crazy Horse exercises an influence for evil. This is clearly a different assessment from the one offered by the surgeon who attended Crazy Horse as he was dying, who uh, stated, I could not but regard him as the greatest leader of his people in modern times. In him, everything was made secondary to patriotism and love of his people. Modest, fearless, a mystic, a believer in destiny, and much of a recluse, he was held in veneration and admiration by the younger warriors who would follow him anywhere. There are probably three sources for why was Crazy Horse killed. There are probably three different things that caused this. One was the jealousy of the other Dakota. The Red Cloud, the American Horse, the Spotted Tail, those guys. One was the fact that Crazy Horse was really not very skilled in diplomacy, and they set up the trap, they set up the bait, and he took it time and time again, getting frustrated and making comments that then will justify the military to pass progressively more restrictive orders and change their attitudes toward him. But the third role in this story is also the role of the United States. The fact that so many military officers have been making false promises and they were only too happy to crack down as soon as some of the other Lakota started spreading this gossip. They are all part of the story. So yes, there's a part of Crazy Orson fault, if you will, but then the other big ones are Lakota jealousy and uh, officers more than willing to see him die. In the words of... Uh, historian who heavily researched this subject, in the words of Jeffrey Hostler, Hostler writes, The killing of Crazy Horse was more than a historical accident or a simple tragedy. It was a logical consequence of US policies for governing a newly conquered people. Black Elk offers his own insight into this. He said, Our people believe they did what they did because he was a great man, and they could not kill him in battle, and he would not make himself over into a Washichu, as Spotted Tail and the others did. He was a very great man, and I think if the Washichus had not murdered him down there, maybe we should still have the Black Hills and be happy. They could not have killed him in battle. They had to lie to him and murder him. And once Crazy Horse is dead, Black Elk will say... I cried all night, and so did my father. And in another one of the statements he makes about Crazy Horse, he says, It doesn't matter where his body lies, for it is grass. 
but where his spirit is, he will be good to be. This event, the killing of Crazy Horse, is so significant that there was a keeper of the Lakota Winter Counts. Lakota Winter Counts were, you know, this uh, essentially a form of recording history where they would record one big event that had happened in every year in pictographic form. Well, one of these tribal historians was so devastated that he stopped keeping track of the years after that, almost as if history had ended with Crazy Horse's death. So here was a man who was not defeated in battle and never signed a treaty, never allowed anyone to take a picture of him. At a time today when most... Uh, all-time leaders are considered controversial, you know, everybody likes some guys and not others, there's all... Crazy Horse is now respected and loved by every Lakota, and most American Indians for that matters, even among the descendants of those who helped kill him. In a super-factional environment, is a unique case of someone who inspires reverence among everybody. But of course, it's a lot easier to have this reverence after somebody's dead than when they are still around. In a curious twist to the legacy of Crazy Horse, today if you drive into the Black Hills of South Dakota, everybody knows the National Monument at Mount Rushmore, you know, famous, you know, the sculpture of the four American presidents in the mountains there. But just a few miles away, there's another colossal sculpture, Crazy Horse Mountain. A uh, sculptor decided to build this monument to Crazy Horse. It's still unfinished to this day, but it's monumental in size, just a few miles away from Mount Rushmore, actually bigger than Mount Rushmore. This is kind of controversial, because on one hand, some Lakota very much love the idea of having a monument to a Lakota leader of such size, but at the same others consider... Um, building into the Black Hills any kind of carving to be desecration. They consider the Black Hills sacred land, they argue that Crazy Horse uh, would have never wanted it. In the words of uh, Lakota, who wrote a really funny book by the name of Lame Deer, Seeker of Visions, he states, Crazy Horse never let a white man take his picture. He didn't want white people to look at him. He died fighting before he would let white soldiers shut him up in a stone guardhouse. He was buried the way he wanted it, with nobody knowing his grave. The whole idea of making a beautiful wild mountain into a statue of him is a pollution of the landscape. It is against the spirit of Crazy Horse. But interesting enough, Lemdir also reports that why his mind is not changed about Crazy Horse Mountain when he meets the sculptor who was doing the work, he actually liked him a lot and understand that even though they had different feelings about the mountain, he felt that his art was in a good place. Now, we spent how many hours talking about Crazy Horse's life? A lot. And yet, there's still a degree of mystery here. Here is a man for whom there's no grave, no pictures, very limited historical information, quite few reliable quotes that can be attributed to him, you know, there's very few words that can be attributed to him. His whole life in some way is shrouded in mystery, and yet the mountain, the countless biographies written about him, the never-ending praise that his name evokes among the Lakota, they tell us one thing, they tell us that Crazy Horse is one of those men who has transcended history and has become a legend.